is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Here's what's coming up on today's program. The U.S. and China agree to further high-level talks as Antony Blinken's Beijing visit wins praise from President Biden and Xi. Meanwhile, China's premier makes his first foreign trip to Germany. Hong Kong tech stocks sell off after Chinese banks disappoint markets with lower-than-expected cuts to lending rates, but Alibaba pairs losses after a surprise leadership announcement. Plus, the UK's two-year yield climbs about 5% for the first time since 2008, ahead of this week's Bank of England rate decision. Now, first and is first, so let's check in on the markets. A lot of the focus is, of course, what's happening in China and uh, the fact that there was a little bit of disappointment with some of the policy measures that they wanted to put in place. The other question, of course, is what's happening with the Fed. Is this the time for, um, you know, interest rates, I guess, being more uncertain than the used to with traders really vacillating between the lure of the, la of the rally and at the same time uh, concerned that the rally is actually exhausted and that the market has become overbrought. You can see that tension play out in the markets almost every day. Euro dollar 109.43. Now something of a mixed picture for European stocks after they open lower worries again about the Chinese economy curbed risk appetite and then we always look at politics as well. I think we're getting some live pictures of the Chinese Premier meeting with Olaf Scholz right now. We could have, I believe those are live pictures. Look at that right on cue. Uh, you can see the two side by side. And this is after we also saw the focus over in China with Anthony Blinken being there earlier on. So we'll keep an eye, of course, on all of these live pictures. The body language seems to be friendly. It seems to be open. And we'll see whether that leads to a trade deal or at least some kind of an agreement to continue talking and investing. Now, joining us to talk about the markets and folding politics into all of this, Annika Benneby, Senior Portfolio Manager at Julius Baer, and Gina Martin-Adams, Chief Equity Strategist at Bloomberg Intelligence. So thank you both for joining us. There's a lot to talk about. Annika, when you look at, um, I guess, the, the difference, which we're also seeing maybe a little bit of fraud in the markets is one day they're up, one day they're down, is that they're really trying to figure out what the path forward for the Fed is and where inflation comes into this. Yes, so I think the Fed being on pause is a very good thing. Um, the more the Fed raises interest rates, obviously, the higher the probability that it plunges the U.S. economy mm -hmm. into recession. So my view is that the Fed has done enough we're seeing inflation come down nicely in the U.S., mm -hmm. and the pause needs to turn into a cease. So what happens, and Gina, I mean, if the pause into, is into a cease, I mean, this is kind of what the markets need to grapple with day in, day out, right? Yeah. They kind of look at the Fed and they say, do I believe what the Fed officials are saying, which there's definitely no cuts, or do I have my inner belief that actually they won't crush the economy? Yeah, I think it's a very good point. And if the pause does turn into a cease, as long as economic data is improving and or earnings data is improving, stocks can do just fine. They don't necessarily need to see an easing in order to perform relatively well. Mm -hmm. Certainly we've seen that so far this year. What is powering the equity market in our view is this deceleration in inflation, which is allowing for an earnings recovery after a very, very difficult earnings landscape of 2022. So as long as we continue to have decelerating inflation, we have economic growth, either slow or at least slightly positive, it probably does power some form of an earnings recovery into 2024. And I think that's what stocks are really grasping at at this point in time. If we get that, we don't need a, a Fed ease, frankly. We're also looking at live pictures um, out of Germany. And we talked a little bit about this, Gina, beforehand is actually how do you view the China recovery that, that frankly has disappointed yeah. many investors. And as you look at these live pictures, for me, it's very telling that Germany invested some 10 billion for that you know, Intel manufacturing plant in Germany. How do we see these industrial compositions change? Yeah, I think it's a very good point. And certainly relations, the relationship geopolitically between the US, China, as well as Germany and China is ex extremely consequential to ultimately resolving a lot of risk tension and geopolitical premium that probably has been embedded into stock prices since the war in Ukraine broke out. But in terms of China's economic contributions, it's been more disappointing for Chinese investors than any, other, any others in the world. Remember, China was a net drag on earnings growth globally throughout 2022, is already expected to be a net drag in 2023 after the disappointments so far this year. So I think China has the opportunity to upside surprise, frankly. Consensus is very grim 
toward China. Everyone came into this year thinking this is going to be the great play. We're going to get some growth out of China. We're going to see some earnings recovery, and that should power stock prices higher. We've had anything but that, and the net result is no one's expecting a whole lot. So I would say China has an opportunity to upside surprise, mm -hmm. even if we get incremental improvements in this post-pandemic sort of era for them. Yeah, and Annika, we have also, you, you have a new index looking at some of, you know, how consumer behavior is changing across the world and also some of your investors are shaping the world of tomorrow. What surprised you the most in what people are looking at right now? So we have the global wealth um, and lifestyle report that Julius Baer launched four years ago. And it really looks at the cost of living well for wealthy individuals mm -hmm. by tracking a basket of discretionary goods that they use every day. So everything from handbags to watches to private school education and uh, residential property. We look at the cost of these items across 25 cities around the world and we rank those cities in terms of most expensive to least expensive. And the most surprising things, things coming out of that are that people are future proofing themselves. They're yeah. focusing on their mental health, physical health, future financial health, but also on the other hand, they're enjoying life. They want to indulge in spending and we've seen an unabated uh, demand for hotel suites, business yeah. travel, that sort of thing. Those prices have really skyrocketed. All right, so thank you both, Annika Benneby there and Gina Martin-Adams. Both stay with us. Coming up, the Chinese premier is in Germany as part of efforts to stabilize ties with Europe. We're looking at live images from Berlin. We'll have the latest on that next. And this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, China's number two official is in Germany on his first overseas trip since becoming premier. It comes as Beijing attempts to prevent ties with Europe plunging to the lows reached with the U.S. Now, the premier, Li Qiang, met with the Chancellor Olaf Scholz last night for dinner at the Chancellery. And we're looking at live pictures, I think, from moments ago as he welcomes him back to the Chancellery. Now, for more, let's bring in our German correspondent, Oliver Kirk, in Berlin. So, Ali, we looked at the schedule last night. I don't know what else, if, we're, if they're going down to business today and actually we'll get some deals. Uh that's right, Francine. I don't know about deals. I think this is going to be more about signals and substance. And if it's about signals, let's inspect the scene that we've got behind me here to try to see what we glean from it. You have the German chancellery. In front of it, you have the premier from China with Olaf Scholz being mil greeted by military honors. Then just behind me here, you have the pro-China demonstrators out of frame. You have the human rights protesters and then the sprinklers, I guess, to revive this relationship, if we can stretch the analogy. Because really, this is a Merkel-era initiative, these bilateral talks of the German government and the Chinese government. Government. And now it's a very different relationship with Olaf Scholz sort of uh, sort of mix about what the future relationship is going to be with China going forward. It's obviously a huge economic uh, imperative there. But really, if we could dig into the symbolism, as far as the Chinese are concerned, for Premier Li's first visit abroad, Germany is the first stop. This is meant to be significant. So if we want to open dialogue and sort of set the path for substance, this is what we hope for today. So what can we expect on the economic front, Ali? That's right. So this moves all the action here. There's going to be a press conference at about 12.30 here. Then it goes down to the economic, uh, the economy ministry, where there will be meetings with business leaders. The Siemens CEO will be there. There were 12 CEOs that met with the delegation yesterday. And in that meeting, Premier Li was saying that basically the sort of de-risking imperative is not incompatible with continued cooperation. And for German companies, that's really going to be the struggle. This is a huge economic relationship for Germany and for China. 300 billion euros worth of trade last year. It is uh, China is Germany's biggest trading partner, and in, uh, in the other direction, in Europe, Germany is China's biggest trading partner. So really the question is, for CEOs, where there's this ambiguity about what the relationship is going forward, all of the signals will be um, watched closely for the decisions they need to make going forward. I thought it was interesting that yesterday, the FT reporting that AstraZeneca looking to spin off its Chinese unit to try to insulate itself potentially to the risks associated with that. Oli, thank you so much. Oliver Kirk, there, our Germany correspondent in Berlin. Now, sticking with German business, by the end of the year, China's homegrown 
by year end could officially end Volkswagen two decade supremacy in the country. The German car maker will not back down without a fight. More from Oliver. Last year, a German car was sold every 6.7 seconds in China. It's the single biggest market for the big three, Volkswagen, BMW, and Mercedes. But the real opportunity is on the road ahead. Every single second, someone in China gets their driver's license for the very first time. And while in the US there are 84 registered cars per 100 people, in China, it's just 23. So for China to catch up with the US, it would take 854 million cars. Since 1984, Volkswagen has reigned supreme in China, but sales are slowing down. And this year, EV upstart BYD overtook VW. By December, it'll be China's biggest car brand, officially ending VW's two-decade reign of supremacy. Down the road, things look even tougher. When it comes to EVs, price is key. In the US, they cost 45% more than gas guzzlers. But in China, EVs are on average 33% cheaper than combustion engine cars. That's partly down to subsidies and unprofitable companies that just may not last. But Das Auto won't go out without a fight ramping up its EVs to meet its competitors head on. It's a race that matters a lot to Germany, where the auto industry is by far the single biggest part of the economy. It's worth almost half a trillion dollars in revenue and employs 800,000 people. So Germany will have to steer a careful path if it wants to de-risk without destroying a fruitful economic relationship with China. Still with us, Annika Benneby, a senior portfolio manager at Julius Baer and Gina Martin Adams, chief equity strategist at Bloomberg Intelligence. So thank you both for sticking with us. You know, when you look at some of the value in European equities, I keep on being told, well, look, you know, U.S. investors find Europe uninvestable at the moment. Okay. And so th there's maybe a little bit of catch up in terms of valuations or some of the pockets of growth that you could see. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't know if U.S. investors find Europe uninvestable, but they have been captivated by a trend in the U.S. <laughs> and it's called AI. In addition, we're starting to see broadening gains in the U.S., so the market has been so powerful so far this year that it's generally capturing most of the U.S. investor attention. That said, when we run our global scorecards, where we relative rank all the nations around the world, we relative rank the super regions as well, Europe does pop toward the top of our scorecard. Europe and Japan are toward the top of our developed markets outside of the U.S. rankings right now, whereas Canada and Australia are toward the lower end. Part of this is due to the fact that Europe and Japan are generally net consumers of falling all commodity prices. So as commodity prices fall off, as inflation pressures ease, those economies tend to perform generally better and the earnings outlooks improve. Whereas somebody like Canada and Australia are very levered to commodity prices in their earnings stream and that becomes a drag. But you're absolutely right. Valuations are incredibly attractive around the world. We just haven't had a big catalyst to drive funds into Europe. Normally, you would see that catalyst emerge with something like a currency transition. We haven't seen that. Some sort of breakout in economic growth or massive deceleration in inflation or a policy ease, which may be the next possible catalyst. We'll see. But generally, they do rank quite favorably relative to the rest of the world. Do, do you break it up in industries? Actually, when, when you look at, you know, through your research, yeah. if you're a luxury group, of course, it's different than if you're like a general consumer goods yeah. company. I think this is an excellent point because the concentration in the European market is quite different at the sector level than it is in, say, the U.S. market, where the U.S. has been able to lever some of the industries that are most exposed to inflation deceleration as well as overall growth prospects for technology. The U.S. market being incredibly market cap sensitive to tech generally puts it in a better position at this stage in the cycle with that as the next catalyst for growth. Europe has less exposure to tech, much more exposure to the consumer, and thus also is also very sensitive to wealth conditions and overall improvements in the markets and asset prices. Now, as we've seen so far this year, asset prices are improving pretty materially. Yeah. If we can get some stability in property markets and other factors that tend to drive consumer confidence, that could be very good for European equities. Also, industrial companies, though. Yeah. Germany is a very industrial-centric country, if we can get some improvement in industrial growth, say a trade relationship or a trade agreement comes down the pike, that could improve the prospects quite materially for Europe. So Annika, how do you build your portfolio? Is it through industries and actually trying to capture some of that growth in the growth spots or is it really region by region? So it is bottom up. We take into account um, sectors, but also diversified geographies. Um, for, for the moment, we are more positive on the U.S for example, because of that exposure to those mega cap tech stocks that have been influenced in AI, 
we think that that trade and that rally has some ways to go because we have seen earnings upgrades. But those earnings upgrades are also spreading to other sectors. So I think we're going into um, a good earnings season and we could see equities go higher, generally speaking. In the U.S., we do like, like I mentioned, that technology, but we cushion that with some defensive exposure. So healthcare, for example, on the back of that demographic story. Is AI in the bubble? I mean, we're kind of trying to, to call it, to, everyone's talking about AI, yeah. right? There's mm -hmm. like this, this race to try and find the next NVIDIA. Do you worry that it looks a bit frothy or it's priced, priced to perfection? I don't think so. So this is not a situation um, like we had in 2000, for example. That was on euphoric multiples. This is not that. We're actually seeing the earnings upgrades. Most of that rally has come from earnings and fundamentals rather than multiple expansion. And I, so, I, so I think, you know, we still have some room to go and it's not a bubble. And, and again, when you look at, again, portfolio building, are there emerging markets that you like above others? And is this sustained on fundamentals or is it just capital flows? Yeah, so there's a lot of talk around China, obviously, at the moment, um, the weakness in that data. Uh, we see weakness in the property sector. Mm -hmm. Certainly developers are completing projects, but they're not starting new mm -hmm. ones. And we have consumers in China who are still quite cautious. They're not borrowing. And so the policy that the government is um, implementing is the wrong policy. Cutting interest rates is not going to get people to borrow when they're in the course of deleveraging. So all of that to say, um, we would probably take a wait and see approach to China at the moment. Um, India is probably one of our more preferred emerging market uh, calls. All right, so thank you both for joining us. Annika Benenby, Senior Portfolio Manager at Julius Baer, and Gina Martin-Adams, Chief Equity Strategist at Bloomberg Intelligence. Now, coming up, the UK's two-year yield climbs above 5% for the first time since 2008, so we tell us what that means for the BOE, and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, the UK's short-term government borrowing costs have climbed past 5% for the first time since the global financial crisis. I'm concerned that the troubling inflation outlook could lead to more aggressive monetary tightening. Let's get more with Bloomberg's John Stepik. So, John, if you look at, first of all, thank you so much for coming on yesterday because it's got loads of social media views as people try and figure out what's happening with their mortgages. But what's causing the durations in gilt markets? Well, it's basically, it's all down to inflation again. Yeah. Um, so, you know, a month ago, the market was pricing in peak rates of 4.75%. Yeah. So effectively thought the, you know, the, the base rate rise this week would be the last one, and then it would be on the way down. And as soon as the, May, the inflation data for April hit the wires in May, uh, everyone suddenly, essentially, the expectation spiked. Um, and then that was confirmed by unemployment data, which has been much stronger than expected as well. So the labour market's running much hotter. Wage growth's been much stronger than expected. Um, and so that's it. It's, it's basically because inflation expectations are much higher. There is a tiny sort of technical point about, because the Bank of England is also currently selling gilt under its quantitative tightening programme. It's much harder to see the exact effect that's having, but it probably doesn't help. But overall, it's very much about inflation. But so, so you don't think, and you're one of the, the outlier calls, right? You don't think interest <laughs> rates go up to 6%, but the market is, go, is tending to go that way because they believe basically that the Bank of England has lost control of inflation. Does it come down? I mean, is that the simple kind of it's, they've lost confidence in the Bank of England? It's, it's that straightforward. There's, there's, there's a loss of confidence in, in the Bank of England. Um, there's also a loss of confidence yeah. in that there's a sense that Britain is an outlier yeah. um, and that there are various special reasons that the UK's inflation problem is worse. Yeah. I'm still not convinced that that's the case, I have to say. I think a lot of the headline inflation is definitely down to the energy price cap yeah. um, and we'll see a lot of that drop out come July's figures. Um, and I also think that if you look at individual countries in Europe, there are actually quite a few that have similar problems to us. Um, on the one hand, you get Germany's in a recession just now, so it's going the other way. 
but Italy, for example, has got similar sort of inflation to the UK. So th there are lots of issues, and I, but I think that the UK has sort of been singled out. Yeah, it's, I mean, the UK also has, a, 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 I guess, a deficit problem, right? Is that it probably needs more investment to grow, but where's the money coming from? But, yeah, well, you see, this is the problem. So, you know, there's lots of people with lots of great ideas about how, you know, we should be using pension fund money, et cetera, to try and channel more growth into the UK and more investment. Um, but the big problem is at the moment you've got, not only have you got a massive kind of uh, government deficit, you also have the highest tax burden in, in like, you know, decades, you know, since the Second World War. That's not that conducive to investment. You know, in an ideal world, you have a lower tax burden, you know, with less regulation, and instead what you've got is arguably, you know, those are all difficult things to put into place. We currently have what I think is fair to describe as a lame duck government, which yeah. can't do those things and instead is looking at short termism. John, thank you so much. As always, clear, crystal clear from John Steppick. Coming up, Bloomberg has learned that UBS faces hundreds of million dollars of fines. More on that next. Hong Kong tech stocks sell off after Chinese banks disappoint markets with lower than expected cuts to lending rates, but Alibaba pairs losses after a surprise leadership announcement. The U.S. and China agreed to further high-level talks as Antony Blinken's Beijing visit wins praise from Presidents Biden and Xi. Meanwhile, China's premier makes his first foreign trip to Germany. Plus, the U.K.'s two-year yield climbs about 5% for the first time since 2008, ahead of this week's Bank of England rate decision. Also, today is World Refugee Day, a day designed by the U.N. to honor refugees around the globe. By the end of last year, more than 108 million people were forcibly displaced as a result of persecution, conflict, violence or human rights violations. So today we think of them. Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, Turkey's Treasury and Finance Ministry has indicated he will take gradual steps in steering towards more conventional policies as the nation looks to restore investor confidence. Now, sources say that adjustments will be made slowly to avoid unwanted side effects. Economists thought, though, expect rates to be raised steeply at Thursday's central bank meeting yesterday saw Turkey's benchmark stock index fell some 3.8 percent, the biggest drop in a month. Turkey hikes minimum wage by 34 percent. That's according to a minister. Um, so again, the Turkey hike ha ha or has increased minimum wage by 34 percent to deal with inflation. On to the banks now. And Bloomberg has learned that UBS faces hundreds of millions of dollars in penalties following investigations by several regulators into Credit Suisse dealings with Archegos Capital. Joining us now for more from our Bloomberg breaking news desk is our editor and finance reporter, Leo Kencherper. So, Leo, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, th these are huge fines. They were reported by the FT. I mean, there are like hundreds of millions of fines. Will UBS pay them? Um, yes, it, it most certainly will. And it's important to note that they already earmarked $4 billion for potential uh, legacy issues yeah. from Credit Suisse. So in theory, in theory, they should cover them. The only thing that's uncertain now is how much of that $4 billion is actually earmarked for Archegos. Right. So, so what does that mean going forward? Again, is it something that they were expecting or is this a, a surprise for UBS? I think it's largely expected and our BI, a Bloomberg Intelligence Analyst this morning, uh, pointed out that um, more than one billion would be uh, unexpected. Yeah. So that's largely expected now. So, um, Leo, UBS has inherited more legal cases when it took over Credit Suisse. Is there anything else that we should be looking out for? Yes, there's two examples that I, that I would like to flag. Uh, one is Greensill. Of course, Credit Suisse is trying to recover money from its investors uh, that put um, funds into um, supply chain finance funds mm -hmm. that were sourced mm -hmm. via Lex Greensill, the, the financier whose uh, business uh, also um, went down two years ago. And that's probably going to drag on for, mm -hmm. for a few more years. And then another most recent example is 81s, mm -hmm. additional tier one debt. And uh, some of the owners of this, of this debt are now suing and um, it, uh, the odds are quite low. I think that's, that's, right. that's fair to say, but it's certainly a distraction. Yeah. Okay, Leo, thank you so much for the roundup. Our Bloomberg Breaking News editor and finance reporter, Leo Kencherper, joining us on this UBS 
and Credit Suisse surprise. Now, Alibaba has also unveiled a surprise succession plan to replace Daniel Zhang, announcing a new chairman and chief executive. They'll take over a company that's been bleeding market share and struggling to revive growth in the post-COVID era. Let's bring Catherine Lim, head of Bloomberg Intelligence Asia Pacific. Catherine, so good morning, good afternoon. What's behind the shakeup? Right, really, I think the move really aligns the management uh, positions with the new structure that was announced a month ago, whereby essentially Alibaba is going to be a holding company. And that's going to be primarily driven by a lot of the e-commerce businesses, particularly if you think about, you know, how they're going to be raising, um, you know, funds for units like the cloud business, logistics, etc. So Alibaba's stake in these non-e-commerce businesses is going to be diluted. And really the bigger contribution to Alibaba going forward will be coming from all this e-commerce business. So it does make sense to actually have a, repre a new representative of this um, e-commerce businesses to come up as the new CEO and to actually drive you know, the holding company going forward. So, uh, Catherine, what does it mean actually for some of the challenges that Alibaba has really had to face with, which frankly they haven't really recovered since, since COVID, and how they will be addressed in the future? Sure. Now, of course, um, this management move doesn't change the fundamentals of the company. Um, essentially, they are still facing increased rivalry from social media platforms like Douyin, the Chinese TikTok, um, as well as Kwai Show, etc. So I think going forward, what is on the shoulders of the new management team will be to really prove that they will be able to defend their existing market share going forward. And it's interesting that, you know, just about half an hour ago, the company held an analyst call. And it's actually really interesting hearing how the up and coming CEO has a technology background and can actually help brief new, um, you know, innovations on technology into the existing e-commerce business itself. So that's the thing I would really be watching out for. So, Catherine, who's calling the shots here? Is it the Chinese government or is it private stakeholders? Right. Well, it, this is still a, um, you know, publicly listed company itself. And of course, you know, Alibaba is going to be mindful of the regulations that the Chinese government has put in place, both the internet sector as well as, you know, particularly when it comes to generative AI and new technologies in the market. So they're going to be abiding the rules, um, they, but they're going to have to actually, um, you know, innovate and, you know, hopefully... Their, their independence, you know, as a private company can actually spear some of the innovations that we will see in the future. All right, Catherine, thanks so much. Catherine Lim there from Bloomberg Intelligence on Alibaba. Now, another story we're following today, the U.S. Coast Guard and other rescuers are racing to find a submersible diving vessel with five people aboard that's missing in the North Atlantic on an expedition to view the Titanic shipwreck. The Coast Guard received a call on Sunday saying contact had been lost with the vessel about 900 miles east of Cape Cod. Now, the missing submersible carries a pilot and four crew members to a maximum depth of 4,000 meters. Coming up, thinking of moving abroad, well, Monocle magazine has revealed its top cities for quality of life. We'll bring you the details next, and this is Bloomberg. Finance politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, for those of you looking to move abroad, Monocle has released its quality of life survey. With low crime and excellent transport system, Vienna holds the top spot. Now, all of the top five cities for quality of life are, in fact, in Europe. Now, joining us now is Tyler Brule, editorial director and chairman of Monocle. Tyler, make us dream. So it's Vienna, but it's how surprising is it that it's European cities that come up on top? Good morning, Francine. Uh, not so surprising because we've discussed this over the years. One of the things that many European cities benefit from is that they were planned, uh, they were developed, the infrastructure uh, went in maybe at the right time. They were built right the first time. 
Uh, so uh, Vienna, of course, you know, once recognized as one of the really the capitals of Europe, uh, maybe not surprised that it had all of the elements in place, you know, the tram networks, when the metro was developed, uh, the airport as well. All of this, of course, serves uh, the city in, in a very good way, not to mention, you know, much of quality of life is about the quality of housing stock, the neighborhoods, all of these things. So uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, Vienna came out on top. But you, know, you mentioned those top five cities. It's a super tight race uh, because Munich also doing a great job. Zurich also doing a fantastic job as well. Maybe Stockholm number five could have been a little bit higher. And one of the things we look at this year is the issue, the issue of violent crime. And that's one of the striking things because it's the first time since we launched this in 2007 that no U.S. or actually no North American city has made it into the top 20. Yeah, and, and this year there was a special focus that you put on, of course, uh, on security. Does that change? I mean, I was surprised, for example, that Vienna, number seven last year, now number one. Munich, number 11 last year, now number three. So uh, how much efforts can actually city mayors put in place to change some of these rankings? I think they can do quite a few things, and it's always interesting. There's a, I would say, sort of towards the end of the year, start of the year, there's a lobbying moment that happens when cities want to talk to us about what have they done with infrastructure, what have they done from a security point of view, what new museum uh, have they attracted uh, to come to the city. Um, but I think that's, uh, in, in a way, sometimes that's also where the message is a bit misguided because, yes, museum is great in terms of cultural input, but is it somewhere that, of course, residents are going to go every day? I'm sitting, of course, uh, here in Milan uh, this morning, and if you just go beyond the Bloomberg windows here, I mean, you know what the crush of tourists are like. And of course, we need tourists uh, for dynamic economies. Uh, but at the same time, we also know that a lot of European cities in particular are very much under pressure. So this idea of a sort of, you know, uh, of having sort of these great cultural monuments, great idea, but it also has to, I would say, be in lockstep with what uh, the electorate wants as well. I think we sat down, went through the list, and I think three of my team are moving to Tokyo, one to Helsinki. I have one wanting to move to Sydney after <laughs> your, your, your you know, quality of life um, ranking. Does, has this changed because of COVID, Tyler? We talk about working from home, but do people want to live in better cities? They do, and I think, of course, people have the ability now, Francine, of course, to work remotely, uh, or they can also... Uh, maybe you know up sticks uh, with their their top management as well, and and of course uh, relocate. So there is absolutely a race on uh, globally. I mean, it's not a new one, but certainly uh, COVID has helped uh, reshuffle the deck, and and certainly you see that in our ranking as well. Yeah, how's Milan doing? You're you joined us from Milan today. I mean, they've cleaned it up. They're trying to attack finance also with tax incentives. Yeah, Milan. Uh, it climbed. Uh, it was sitting in the 20s. It's now 18 this year. And again, this is a city which is really, you know, is booming. You see a lot of people moving here. Uh, of course, you know, Linate, never sort of a loved airport. Uh, now people think, wow, fantastic, an airport close to the city center, one which has also been redeveloped uh, as well. So, you know, this has, you know, gone some distance. But also you have, of course, you know, access to the mountains, access to the sea from here. So there's been, I think, a big relook at the city. And it's probably one of the cities, Francine, as well, which has really done a very good job. When they had the expo here, um, it wasn't squandered. You saw a lot of sort of great infrastructure go into the mix, into the city, uh, and, and that is why uh, it's, it holds the position it does now. Tyler, I just love what you put in some of these city winners like survey, right? Because you have whether you can get a good meal after 10 p.m. I mean, who does not need a good deal after 10 p.m.? Even, I would add, if you wake up at 3 right. in the morning because you work for Bloomberg TV, but also accessibility of public swimming spots. Has what we, you know, do, do we want different things from our city now? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, one, I think commuting is obviously a, a huge component uh, <laughs> around this. Yeah. And, and that is, a, yeah, a nightmare. So I think obviously cities which have got good infrastructure, cities uh, where, of course, uh, they're walkable, uh, where you have a good cycling infrastructure, a cycling infrastructure which is not forced. Of course, you know, you see cities like, you know, I was in Toronto recently, you know, a big discussion about the cycling network there, you know, partly because it's not used for most of the year. Uh, it's still very much a car city. And, you know, do you want to be on a bike in, the, in Toronto in the middle of February? Probably not. Um, so I think there's, you know, again, uh, you, you see a number of things. I mean, you're off to Zurich next week. I'm based in Zurich. You know, there the lake. I mean, the transformative power of that lake, all of the swimming clubs, of course, goes very far when people think about where they want to live. 
Yeah, and I don't know whether how much time you think, uh, Tyler, ab about you know reorganizing some of the office buildings, about how people again, maybe they've abandoned some of the business hotels, and how some of these can be regenerated, and whether that's the big question, um, it, including of course how to have house the, the homeless in in the next couple of years. Whether those are really the, the real issues that mayors have to tackle. Absolutely. I mean, these are of course key elements, and and with it, of course, comes. You know, we have to address also the social you know, issues that come with it, the security issues as well. If you can't get a grip on the fundamentals, you can deploy all of the police that you want and all of the anti-terror barricades, etc. But if you don't get to the root of the problem uh, with homelessness, uh, why people are, are displaced, uh, then of course, you know, it spirals out of control. And that's, you know, it's really one of the things that when you look at the challenges that, you know, many North American cities have at the moment, it's actually not tackling the fundamentals. I mean, we can talk about and have a discussion about policing. Uh, but there are many things that have to, of course, happen at, uh, at ground level, which you know, simply aren't occurring. Or certainly, uh, there, might, there might be attempts at a fix, uh, but certainly no one's come up with a remedy yet. Uh, Tyler, have the people that actually have, have fled big cities during COVID come back to big cities? I think, yes, I, I, I do see that. Uh, I think there has been a return, uh, you know, and, and it's interesting. What, one thing we have to sort of address here is that the world is not flat. I mean, of course, you know, here we are on Bloomberg broadcasting across the world. I think a lot of people think that the world, well, you know, uh, is, is, is the whole world like San Francisco or is the whole world like New York? And, that, and that's certainly not the case. Uh, you know, Singapore is functioning in a very, very different way. Uh, then, and, and you could say the same of, of Hong Kong, uh, then versus Paris uh, or versus Boston. Um, but I do think that you have seen a return uh, to, to cities. City centers, uh, you know, maybe not, or at least not in, in North American cities. And I think that's one of the big challenge that mayors have, you know, uh, uh, you know when, they, when they look ahead. How are you going to, it's not about getting people back into the offices, but what are you going to do with all of these, these derelict spaces? Tyler, as always, thanks so much, uh, Tyler Brewer, there, editorial director and chairman of Monocle, with this really great quality of life survey. I think it uh, hits the stores on Thursday. I had a copy of Monocle, but it was, of course, taken from me as somebody wanted to read it as soon as I walked in. Coming up, we'll, we're live at the Paris Air Show, where airlines have been boasting record deals. More on what that means for the industry next. And this is Bloomberg. Each exogenous shock is unique. Uh, it's tempered me on yeah. how I approach labor on the forward-looking view. I think we're going to be a little more conservative on that. But each crisis, you got to stare into and decide how do you manage this company moving forward. As you say, the supply chain's coming back. I understand you're talking about the fact you're going to take the 737 line up to 38. When, when is that going to happen? Look, soon. I'm not going to give you an exact on. date, but it's this year. Uh, it's oh, absolutely within the year. And uh, we're very near that moment. Uh, and what's we, the next uh, we're running that? at 31. Uh, we're about to go to 38. And then we'll look at a, a break in the 42 before the end of the year. Before the end of the year, you think you'll be at 42? Yes. Okay. Uh, let's talk about what else is going on. You've got a 767 program that is going to struggle with ICO regulations, the emission regulations that's coming up. You've applied for an exemption on that. Does that mean I'm not going to get, I'm not going to see a 787 freighter anytime soon? Uh, look, I think the 767 today on the environmental front does a great job in terms of per ton uh, delivering the right emission answer. In the future, we'll look at other variants. The 787's the next natural act because it's got the right size, it's got the right uh, If you don't get the ICO exemption, do you, do you go straight for it? Well, look, we're looking at it, uh, but right now we're very focused on the 67 as the next solution. Let's talk a little bit about kind of what comes next. Um, this is an industry that is going to be supply constrained for a while by the looks of things. Is that something that you are going to use to your advantage? It, it was really interesting. The car industry during the downturn learned that it could make fewer cars and make more money. Does that apply to the aerospace industry as well? Well, I, I think what we uh, look at is, you know, what the long-term demand needs to be, and then we have to factor in 
what can the supply chain do? Yeah. Uh, we've always tried to be conservative in terms of net output, uh, not to overproduce to the market. We know that is bad for pricing. Yeah. Uh, and we're going to be responsible on responding to demand. And it's got to be done within the capabilities of the supply chain. So I think it's a, it's a it, the long and short, we want to try to run right at demand or slightly under as yep. a Boeing company, uh, never overproduce, keep the financial viability of the assets there for our, uh, the airline and those who invest in these assets. Am I going to see a big order today? Am I going to see a big order tomorrow? Am I going to see a big order this I think week? you'll see orders at the air show, guys. Boeing orders? Boeing orders. Big uh, Boeing orders? We're going to see some nice orders. Well, Boeing's head of commercial operations, Stan Deal, they're speaking to our very own Guy Johnson exclusively at the Paris Air Show. Well, more from the show now. The event has already seen a flurry of huge deals, including the biggest plane order in history from India's Indigo for 500 of Airbus's best-selling A320s. Now, some industry veterans are warning that some airlines are at risk of over-ordering and that a more cautious approach is needed. Bloomberg's Guy Johnson joins us now. Guy, you're the absolute expert in this, and you've done some really fantastic interviews on the ground. Are we seeing a bubble in aviation? There, there is certainly that danger, Francine. We're seeing some huge orders. We saw that Indigo order, the biggest order ever placed. So there is certainly a, a risk that airlines might be overordering. Now, the reason they're overordering, there, there are different factors at play here. Um, there is serious concern that the availability of slots from Airbus and Boeing are going to be limited for quite some time. So you want to get your place in line. You want to make sure that you're actually going to get some air aircraft so that you can grow your business. Uh, and I think there's certainly a little bit of fear around that. So airlines may be overordering. What I think is going to be interesting here is whether or not Airbus and Boeing, and you just heard Stan Deal from Boeing talking about this, maybe they're going to take a more cautious approach. What you may see is limited capacity constraining the airlines and ultimately that producing a smoother curve in terms of the growth story that we're going to see here but potentially a, a more sustainable growth curve as well uh, because the airlines can't get all the aircraft they need right now and as a result of which we may see the uh, the, the cycle longer but at some point there is a danger uh, that all this over ordering does lead to a glut of aircraft in operation uh, and that could see prices coming down really quite sharply the other fact you've got to bear in mind in all of this Francine is how the 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 pricing environment is working Airbus and Boeing are going to be working really hard on this they're going to be selling they're, they're taking orders now for aircraft they're not going to deliver potentially for another decade how do you factor in inflation how do you factor in uh, what's going to be happening with inflation 10 years yeah. down the road into your pricing model. And all of this is really complicated in terms of the financial engineering that we're seeing right now, which makes some of these deals really difficult to do. And that's why they're coming right down to the wire in terms of uh, when they're going to be announced. Guy, thank you so much. Uh, of course, we'll get more from Guy to see whether there's a risk that this over, or, you know, over ordering also uh, means a little bit of headwinds in other parts of the supply chain. Now, get all of the latest from the Paris Air Show and everything happening in the French capital from our new newsletter. Scan our QR code to sign up to the Paris Edition newsletter so you don't miss out on weekly updates in France's finance industry. Now, stay with Bloomberg TV as we'll also be speaking to the Airbus chief executive. Guillaume Fourier and the Raytheon chief executive Greg Hayes later today. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Danny Berger and Priti Gupta. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong Our top stories today. Global stocks decline as U.S. markets wake up from a long weekend. Concerns over the weekend then expected stimulus out of China weigh on investor sentiment. Thawing tensions, U.S. State Secretary Antony Blinken's meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping restores communications between the two countries after months of heightened tensions. Both sides vow to continue with more high-level visits to come. And UBS is reportedly facing hundreds of millions of dollars in penalties over Credit Suisse's dealings with Archegos Capital. Imposed fines may come from U.S. and U.K. regulators, according to Bloomberg reporting. 
Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London with Kriti Gupta in New York. Kriti, so great to join the early edition team and joining when the talk of the town is, are we in a new U.S. bull market? Yeah, day one for Danny Berger. We're excited to have you. Mm -hmm. I think you completely nailed it here. Are we in a new bull market? Yeah, we're still dealing with a lot of concerns. There's still a lot of doom and gloom out there. And Danny, of course, we get paid uh, in the media to really uh, ha accelerate that doom and gloom, if you will. You are seeing it from the Federal Reserve. You're seeing it from geopolitics. You're also seeing it from China, which is, I think, where you are expecting to see a little bit more of the market read. I'm going to start from the bottom up here. Our radio audience, stick with me. Overnight, we saw the Hang Seng Index drop by about 1.5%. Essentially, you hit it, Danny. This idea that the Chinese stimulus that a lot of people were expecting did not come through to the same extent that they really wanted. And that is weighing on sentiment around the world. You are seeing futures as a result down about four tenths of 1%. But remember, geopolitics is baked in there as well. U.S. and Chinese uh, kind of government officials meeting over the weekend. Some are saying that there's progress. Others are saying not so much. Anyways, regardless, the lack of progress perhaps uh, is also going to be weighing on sentiment. But then you have to factor in the bond market, the Federal Reserve. Remember, a lot of these bets on more uh, of a hawkish Federal Reserve are kind of ramping up, which brings me to the two-year yield of about 472. Unchanged at the moment, but really keep an eye on this one because it's getting closer and closer to that 5% terminal rate on the front end of the curb, which tells you that as you start to see uh, some of these hawkish bets getting priced in further and further into the year, the two-year yield is probably going to get higher and higher. And again, we are seeing it creep in that direction. Also worth noting that around the world, you're seeing a similar story. This conversation between hiking and pausing overnight, Danny, we also got a message from the RBA. They released their minutes and essentially revealed that, well, there was a conversation about pausing instead of hiking. And remember, two weeks ago, we saw the RBA and the Bank of Canada kind of make waves by making those hawkish bets. But apparently, a pause was on the table. Nevertheless, that pushing uh, the Aussie dollar down by eight-tenths of one percent against the greenback, it is the biggest weight on the Bloomberg dollar index at the moment, which at the moment is unchanged, Danny. And we are looking at another negative day here in Europe, Kriti. Yesterday, we didn't have that impulse from the U.S. Open to lift European equities. That's a lot of times what we see. It's a negative session in China, a negative session in Europe until the U.S. comes online. Will that change today? For now, Again, we're just kind of drifting lower. It's some of the cyclicals that are doing the worst. The DAX, the most red of the regions, that's down seven tenths of one percent. It's things like chemical companies, autos. Again, really economically exposed type sectors are the ones that are doing more poorly. So if you look at the overall headline index, we are moving lower on the stock 600. So let's flip up the boards and take a look at that. Down four tenths of one percent. It was a better day for Telecom Italia. It's given up some of its gains. Finally, it's going to be getting a uh, likely, according to reports, uh, exclusive conversations with KKR about taking over its network operations. This has been such a long deal. Are we finally getting to the end of it after KKR upped its bid? The real drama yesterday was in the front end of the UK curve. This thing has moved 160 basis points in the past quarter. That's only happened one other time in history in the past, or at least since as long as we have data, three decades back. We're coming in a little bit today, but we're still solidly above 5%, a level we haven't seen since 2000. 2008. And finally, it's a divide between the Hawks and the Bulls over at the ECB. Schnabel at a conference saying that they want to err on the side of doing too much rather than too little. Lane, who of course is a dove, saying, look, it's way too soon to be talking about September. We've already done a lot of hikes. But for now in the market, the Hawks are winning out a stronger euro versus the dollar today, Critty. Certainly something you're going to be keeping an eye on because at the end of the day, central banking is at the core of the trade around the world. Which brings us to the Asian story. Chinese banks disappointed investors with a modest cut to its five-year rate after some economists predicted a bigger reduction. Joining us now for more is Bloomberg's Ksenia Galuchko. Ksenia, this expectation of Chinese stimulus is so important because going back to the global financial crisis, that stimulus from China helped the rest of the world. Talk to us about why this time we didn't get that stimulus. That's right. So today said uh, a reduction in rates came in as a disappointment to uh, market players. Some economists had actually predicted a 15 basis point cut, but that did not occur. And again, with the slowdown in China's recovery, which at first proved to be quite strong at the end of last year, fueling a global equity recovery, especially in Europe, this has now is showing signals of slowing down. So the economic recovery is really stumbling in China, creating concerns for global markets. So if we don't have China that can lead the push higher in global equities, what can at this point, Ksenia? 
At this point, it's actually quite interesting. So yes, we had disappointing news out of China this morning, but actually U.S. equity futures and European stocks are actually not doing too badly. Yes, we started off on a weaker note this morning, but then equities very quickly erased those losses. And the main reason is that uh, equity investors are actually much more focused on profit growth and also on the Fed and ECB signals, which are saying that they will pause the rate uh, hikes and they will continue to exert more stimulus on the market as uh, uh, the economic recessionary headwinds are growing. At the same time, this China slowdown is a big concern for luxury stocks in Europe because in Europe, the recovery has been led by these major luxury companies like LVMH, Caring. And if the China slowdown continues, if the consumer demand there continues to be weaker, that is going to be a major concern for European stocks. Mm -hmm. Certainly something that is going to have those ripple effects throughout the markets around the world. Boomers Ksenia Galushko, all over that story. We thank you as always. And sticking with the China story, U.S.-China relations moving past months of icy tensions as State Secretary Blinken's visit to Beijing opens up paths for further communication. Joining us now to break it all down, Bloomberg's Beijing Bureau Chief John Liu. John, talk to us about how these talks actually went. If you look at the readouts from the U.S. and from China, one is far more friendly than the other. Uh, what should we know about what happened this weekend? I think the most important thing to know about what happened is that Secretary Blinken actually came. I don't think there's anything in this relationship you can take for granted at this point. Secretary Blinken was supposed to come in February. He didn't make it because of the spy balloon. He came. He had a seven-plus-hour talk with the Chinese foreign minister, Qin Gong. He met with China's top foreign policy uh, official, Wang Yi. And he met with Xi Jinping. And so uh, this is the highest level visit from, the, uh, from a U.S. official that we've had in five years. Uh, maybe they could have gotten military to military talks, which uh, Washington had wanted. But even without that, we didn't get that announcement. Even without that, I think there is some level of success just by the fact that it happened. So what, what now, John? Is it setting the stage for a Xi Biden meeting? Well, there's obviously going to be more talks. Uh, Chinese Foreign Minister Qing Gong has been invited to Washington. He's accepted. We're expecting uh, Secretary Yellen, John Kerry, among others, to come to Beijing soon. And as you point out, uh, a Xi Biden uh, meeting, maybe at G20 uh, in September, is something we're all looking out for. Uh, all setting up for Xi to visit the United States in November when the U.S. hosts APEC. Uh, but as all of that is happening, you're going to still have these two countries wrestling with each other. We have the Chinese premier in Germany today telling business leaders that if there is going to be de-risking, de it should be led by corporations. Uh, there's going to be uh, continued efforts to increase influence on both sides. And so uh, lots of tension still, even as talks continue. Okay, John, thank you very much for the update there. Beijing Bureau Chief John Liu. Now, Bloomberg has learned that UBS faces hundreds of millions of dollars in penalties following investigations by several regulators into Credit Suisse's dealings with Archegos Capital. Joining us now on this is J.P. Barnett. J.P., it, it honestly feels like this was a decade ago. Of course, Archegos, a lot has happened, but it's not that long ago. H how bad is this for UBS to be facing these fines? Uh, well, it actually does feel like a decade ago. You're absolutely right there. Um, but uh, I think that's because we have talked about it so, so much that uh, it really feels like an old story. But I mean, like, I would say it's not too bad for UBS. Of course, it's not looking great. But uh, everybody knew that UBS will inherit all the issues that Credit Suisse. And that is the main reason why uh, UBS got Credit Suisse on a rather uh, cheap price. I mean, let's not forget that they only paid a couple of millions uh, for the bank that was worth uh, more than 15 billion um, uh, euro, uh, Swiss francs just like a couple of months ago. So so um, from a financial perspective, this is not something that uh, the top executives at, uh, at UBS will, will have sleepless nights over. Um, the, the bigger question for investors, I guess, is like how much else is there in the books of Credit Suisse? Um, and uh, as it comes to litigation costs and expenses, you only can estimate them so far. And then you have to see what's, what's next. Um, and these unknowns are never great for a, for a stock going forward. And I, and I guess it will be an ongoing and repeated topic on the upcoming earnings calls uh, for UBS. As to, to give color on how these matters will be solved uh, as quickly as possible. Well, how does UBS deal with something like that? What are the options that are even on the table at a time when, to your point, they're already absorbing a lot of these costs from Credit Suisse? Do we have to see it in deal volume, perhaps? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the UBS has to do two things, and both, I would say, have to happen rather fast. We know it's a complicated murder, merger, and we can't, like, put too much time pressure on them. But I guess, like, the idea for the top executives at UBS is to um, 
deal with those pressing pressing uh, issues first to get investors at ease. And the last messages that we saw coming out of uh, of UBS go in that direction. So with all the litigation stuff, I would expect them that they sit down with the regulator rather today than tomorrow, basically, um, and and talk out okay, what's what's the fine going to be? How can we settle this as quickly as possible? And then the matter is off the table, and then they can focus on the really tough stuff, which is the operating business, and to align that and to merge all the systems and the employees and the clients and so on and so forth. So that would be my guess. Uh, take those litigations. I mean, you have to deal with them anyway. Um, and as long as the number that is at the end uh, on the bill is acceptable, they will do everything they can, I guess, to um, not have this issue on the agenda every single earnings call. Yeah, certainly. And, and of course, then attention will certainly turn to what sort of job cuts we're going to be looking at after Amadi's opinion piece over the weekend. JP, thank you so much for that. That's Bloomberg's Jan Patrick Barnett. Now, coming up, we're going to speak to Steve Sang, director of the SOAS China Institute on the outlook for U.S.-China relations following the Blinken visit. And we're going to catch up with J.P. Morgan's Madison Fowler on whether the stock market is set up for a second quarter rally. Is the bull market really here? Plus, Harry Colvin, senior market strategist at Longview Economics, will join us to push ahead to the BOE decision. This is Bloomberg. Progress is hard. It takes time. And it's not the product of one visit, one trip, one conversation. Um, my hope and expectation is uh, we will have better communications, better engagement going forward. That's certainly not going to solve uh, every problem between us. Far from it. But it is critical to doing what we both agree is necessary, and that is responsibly managing the relationship. It's in the interest of the United States to do that. It's in the interest of China to do that. It's in the interest of the world. That was Secretary of State Anthony Blinken during his two-day trip to Beijing. The secretary there speaking simply about the progress that they are making in terms of really kind of making those icy tensions just a little less icy or thawing at least. Joining us now, Steve Sang, director of the SOAS China Institute, joins us with a little bit more perspective. Steve, if you look at the readouts from these two sides of these meetings, there wasn't exactly uh, any signs that they were on the same page. It feels like the U.S. readout sh signaled far more progress than the China side did. What was your initial take? Well, what struck me very much was the mature approach towards diplomacy that Blinken and the Americans have taken and the mix of a element of maturity and element of juvenile behavior on the part of the Chinese uh, leadership because the Chinese were much more focused on the posturing, the lecturing on, of the Americans to uh, Blinken. I mean, it's very clear from Xi Jinping's meeting with Blinken that it was mostly Xi Jinping talking and Blinken listening. For all that, the Chinese really wanted the Americans to retract from the American position before they even wanted to talk to the Chinese. Blinken has managed to use diplomacy the way that diplomacy was meant to be used to re-establish high-level dialogue. That's really all that has been achieved. But it is not a mean achievement given the, the attitude of the Chinese government at the moment. Well, how does the Chinese government then approach things like perhaps a little bit more iciness from the Biden administration, tariffs that still haven't been removed yet, relative to some of the reception or some of the attention that they're getting from corporate CEOs, the likes of Elon Musk, Jamie Dimon, uh, and others? How is that received? Well, that's a classic Chinese united front approach, which is that they engage as widely as they can in order to divide the other side that's being engaged, to isolate the U.S. administration and get U.S. Uh, big businesses to ch lobby on their behalf against the U.S. government for the U.S. government to change their policy. I mean, what came through in this visit is that Blinken has not made any concessions on those big issues uh, that the United States is con interested in and concerned about. And yet he still managed to have that talk all the way to with uh, Xi Jinping. 
That, that is so fascinating because we've heard similar language from the Chinese premier about Germany saying that it should be the German CEOs that take on the de-risking charge, not the government. Has that approach worked? I mean, as, as Kriti mentioned, you have had all of these executives coming over to China. Well, it is more effective than we in the West like to think. I think it was Lenin who used to say famously that with the capitalist, they will sell you the rope to hang themselves. And that is, in a sense, what they are still playing out of the playbook in terms of how they try to engage with large Western businesses to appeal to their economic uh, business interests in order to get them to persuade their governments to ease their policies towards China so that China can get its way. Steve, this might be a first getting a, a Lenin quote into the show. Um, OK, given, given all of that, and, and, and given just the fact that, look, that there are differences between the US and China that are fundamental, things like Taiwan, for example, how do we measure progress in this relationship? Well, I think the progress there is that things don't blow up. The big issue about Taiwan is that the basic US positions and the basic Chinese positions are not reconcilable. China wants Taiwan. The United States position is that people in Taiwan must decide their own future. And the range of options available to people in Taiwan is something that the Chinese government does not accept, nor for that matter does the Chinese government accept that people of Taiwan have a right to decide their own future. It's a future for China to decide. So as long as they can keep that relationship on an even keel and avoid a conflict, it is a success. Well, on the Taiwan front, you've already started to see a lot of investors hypothetically kind of pull out from uh, investing in, in companies like TSMC, for example, on the threat of, of the China risk. Walk us through the way this is perceived from the China side as we start to see these massive investments in other parts of Asia, especially from chip companies, Japan, India, I believe Intel uh, investing about $25 billion in Israel over the weekend or announcing that at least. How is that interpreted from China that the investment is going away from the mainland? Well, the Chinese government see that as a demonstration of American hostility. They see it as the United States being the black hand, uh, driving all these changes in order to harm China's economic well-being and innovative progress. And therefore, they do blame the Americans for it. And that is exactly why I said, in this context, Blinken being able to do what he did was not a mean achievement, because the Chinese really want the Americans to do rather more than Blinken has done. And walk us through then the story of just kind of how this is all done in terms of pricing. We know that China, for example, competes actively with the likes of Japan and South Korea when it comes to exporting through the rest of the world. Steve, again, what more can China or the United States do when it comes to more hostile relations beyond just this era of deglobalization? I think the Americans are, in a sense, reining back in terms of the uh, entrenchment of the tension between China and the United States. The changing of the rhetoric from decoupling to de-risking is intended very much by the Americans to do so. Now, the Chinese choose to, de to interpret it that de-risking is just another name for decoupling, and therefore there isn't really any change in U.S. policy and they wanted the Americans to demonstrate, to take actions to demonstrate that they are not actively working to weaken the Chinese economy and China's capacities to export and compete across the board. Now, um, reality is that the Chinese economy will go the way that it will go. It will not simply be changed by whatever U.S. policy will be. But the tension right. which will remain is going to get, make it more difficult. Well, well there, there have been also some signs that maybe China has turned more internal itself as well, of course, as, as they had for a, a long time with their whole tech ecosystem. Is there some degree where, where China also wants to be less reliant on the U.S., especially if they plan at some point to take action on Taiwan, which you'd, of course, see a big backlash from Western countries? Oh, the Chinese have been 
for quite a while trying to be much more self-sufficient and less dependent on the on the West. So the whether you call it the risking or decoupling, it was some a policy that was pursued by both sides. In fact, it was Xi Jinping who, in 2013, who started the process of doing so uh, well before Donald Trump came on the scene and announced a policy of decoupling with uh, China. What they really want is that the Western economies, including the US, continue to be more dependent on the Chinese economy, with the Chinese economy less dependent on the West. And in the meantime, they want to increase domestic consumption and use that as a new driver for growth in the Chinese economy. They haven't been too successful there because the domestic economy is also losing steam and not doing quite as well as they would like it to be. Yeah, on that point, I mean, the data has disappointed. There hasn't been any grand showing of stimulus. Steve, are you surprised we haven't seen more stimulus coming out of China? It's only been, there have been measures, but not as big as some economists had hoped for. Well, that is correct, but that reflects the different kind of approach that Xi Jinping takes compared to his predecessors. Um, Xi Jinping is not focused on economic growth or the percentage of economic growth. He is focused on making the economy strong and innovative and competitive in other ways. So he doesn't really necessarily see the need for um, boosting the economy when, when the growth rate is weakening. And he also wanted to deflate the real estate market. But the real estate market account for something like 30% of growth in the Chinese economy. And with the stock, uh, real estate market being uh, as poorly as it is, uh, they are just not going to get the domestic economy up and running fast um, at the moment. Okay, so then, kind of counter to what we've been talking about, Steve, does China need the U.S. right now? Is that part of what accounts for the timing of this Blinken visit, that internally, if you don't want to do things like encourage more property speculation, maybe you need help from people who are kind of friends, kind of not friends at this moment? I think you put your fingers on it right there. The Chinese do still need the United States and the Western economies that's why they are still going out to try to reach out. And that's why there's still opportunities for investments in China and for trade with China. But what the Chinese want is to do so on their terms, rather than on terms that are being laid down by the United States or other Western democracies. So, and that also explains why they are engaging so much with the, uh, the top Western business community in order to get them to lobby on their behalf. Mm. Okay, Steve, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate that. That's Steve saying of SOAS China Institute. Critty, look, there are folks plenty worried about the Chinese economy. Goldman, for example, over the weekend, they cut their GDP forecast for the country. They did see 6%. That's now lowered to 5.4%. Yeah, and it's really interesting to talk about kind of the ripple effects around the world, Danny. One of my favorite kind of historical fun facts. I was a history major at UVA, as you know. It's simply <laughs> that in 08, 09, one of the major kind of things that got the U.S. economy back on the right footing was this massive infrastructure stimulus from China, this massive investment. So I wonder to what extent the ripple effects are going to be perhaps even more crucial this time around. Yeah, what's going to take the mantle of global growth if it's not the U.S. and certainly not Europe? Well, we're going to talk about markets coming up, Critty, and all of this. We're going to be speaking with Madison Fowler, global investment strategist at J.P. Morgan next. Can you be optimistic if China isn't giving these markets a lift? Can the U.S. take the mantle? Is this a real bull market? Lots to talk about. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Global stocks decline as U.S. markets wake up from a long weekend. Concerns over weaker-than-expected stimulus out of China is weighing on investor sentiment. And thawing tensions, U.S. State Secretary Anthony Blinken's meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping restores communications between the two countries after months of heightened tensions. Both sides vow to continue talking with more high-level visits to come. 
And UBS is reportedly facing hundreds of millions of dollars in penalties over Credit Suisse's dealing with Archegos Capital. Imposed fines may come from the U.S. and U.K. regulators, according to Bloomberg reporting. I'm Krita Gupta in New York with Danny Berger in London. Danny, a lot to digest. At the heart of it, it feels like this China story having real ripple effects in today's trading session. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was really negative for Europe yesterday, and we're continuing that based off of China. Um, the concern there is we wanted this kind of shock and awe stimulus uh, coming from China's state council over the weekend. We didn't get that. We also, in terms of bank rate cuts, that wasn't as much as we had hoped either. So what supports global growth right now, if not China? It doesn't necessarily look like it's going to be Europe or the U.S. Sure, maybe we avoid a recession, but even so, a second soggy day for European equity down four tenths of one percent a better day for telecom italia finally getting some movement on their deal to sell their networks kkr according to people familiar might be close to entering negotiations with them uh, then the two-year yield i mean this move has been remarkable in the uk we're back above five percent the first time since the financial crisis there's been a lot of hot data coming in it was labor market data last week we're going to get cpi tomorrow in the uk and then a very difficult boe decision finally the euro, some of that strength petering out. We are getting close to 110. A pretty clear split between the bulls, uh, the hawks rather, I'm mixing up all my animals here, between the <laughs> hawks and the doves. But we did hear from Schnabel uh, overnight saying that it's better that they err on the side, Critty, of doing too much rather than too little. Yeah, it's interesting. That seems to be a sentiment around the world and certainly something you saw overnight in the Asia session as well. I'm going to start there before we get into the U.S. price action because, to your point, the kind of hawkishness that you are seeing is something that kind of reflected even in the Australian session, for example. You saw the Aussie dollar uh, really start to weaken based on the idea simply that uh, the RBA minutes came out and they actually considered a pause on that co growth concern, Danny, that you just laid out. It is actually the biggest weight on the Bloomberg dollar index today. In addition, you have the Hang Seng index really taking a hit down about one and a half percent overnight on this idea that the PBOC did not come through with the same stimulus that they were largely expected to by economists and investors alike. Put that together and you're really seeing it waste on futures down about five tenths of one percent, 44.33 on those contracts. But then again, it comes back to the central banking story on this side of the Atlantic. Simply the idea that if you were talking about a even more hawkish Federal Reserve in the coming uh, months and arguably years, if Chairman Powell has his way, the two-year yield has a lot of catching up to do. 472 on the front end of the curve, Danny. All right, well, let's get more into these markets. And joining us now is Madison Fowler, global investment strategist at J.P. Morgan Private Bank. Madison, thanks so much for joining. Um, look, I want to kick us off with a quote from Mike Wilson of Morgan Stanley, who has a, a bearish tilt, as, as you would expect uh, him. He wrote uh, in a note saying that if second half growth reaccelerates as expected, then the bullish narrative being used to support equity prices will be proven correct. If not, many investors may be in for a rude awakening given the very big reach for risk we are seeing. Are we in for a rude awakening, Madison? Thank you for having me, and great question to start off with. So I think you know we do have to take into context the you know strong rally that we've had so far, but what I would say when, is when we do rely on historical comparison, when we look back at prior bear markets, when we look at the last 11 bear markets, when the S&P 500 has rallied 20% from the lows, typically the you know stock market tends to rally another 20% over the course of the next year. I think you know that's not to say it's all smooth sailing from here, and we're not necessarily calling for another 20% upside from current levels. We're, I think, a little bit more conservative than that. But I think when we look at the idea that we've all been so obsessed about recession for so long and that stocks corrected a lot already last year in anticipation of that, um, that does lead us, I think, to, I think, you know, pricing more in ter terms of future expectations. So when you look at future expectations, earning revisions are actually inflecting higher. Mm -hmm. And so for us, that, you know, I think leads us to believing that stocks will be higher a year from now than where they are today. And, and to that point, in terms of we all expected a recession, at least one by now, did we kind of just get married to this view and we said, okay, if we haven't got one, maybe we'll get one later? Is that what's happening right now? 
Sure. So I think, you know, what's been surprising is that um, the economy has held up, you know, far better than expected. It's been a stronger start to the year. But nonetheless, we are seeing, you know, waning momentum on the back of that. You, you know, can look at manufacturing activity, look at housing, um, look at decline in, in CapEx spending. Uh, but I do think, you know, while it has, we have come from, you know, this place of resilience, we do expect that slowing momentum to continue to be the case as tighter credit conditions continue to roll their way through the economy. But I think I think the point there um, is just that the market is not the economy. So coming into the year, we had this view of you know having weaker growth but stronger markets, and I do think that thesis is playing out. Weaker growth but stronger markets. How long does that last, though, Madison? When we're talking about simply the growth picture uh, for the economy, at the end of the day, you do still need economic momentum forecasted, say six to twelve months out, for these gains to continue. And yet, there's still a recession somewhere in the cards. Has that already been priced in in the carnage of 2022? I think that I think that's fair. I mean, I think when you look at how stock markets tend to perform around, you know, changing economic cycles, it's typically the valuation contraction that happens first, and then thereafter you see that declining earnings momentum, um, and then you see that you know the upswing happen a bit later. And so I think that valuation contraction part is what we experienced last year when we saw the worst year for the S and P 500 since the global financial crisis, um, and now we've had two negative quarters of, of earnings growth for the S and P over the prior two quarters. And now as you know, I think we have this go forward basis. Again, we're looking at earnings um, expectations moving higher. But I think what's even more constructive from my perspective is that this isn't a rally that is, you know, solely focused on tech. Over the course of the last, you know, few weeks, we've, we've really started to see that broaden out um, to other pockets of the market. For instance, small and mid cap companies are handily outpacing um, their large cap peers. And then certainly when you look outside of the U.S., um, 30 13 countries out of the 48 that we track are actually also outperforming the U.S. So I think, you know, we do have to take a broader perspective here as well. Well, when you're talking about those kind of evaluation contexts, I take your point that valuations in 2022 certainly collapsed. But from here on out, from an entry point kind of perspective, do valuations really matter? Should that be in kind of the thinking of an average investor? One of my favorite quotes came from a very well-known tech bull, Dan Ives, and he came out and said, look, if you were worried about valuations in the last 10 to 15 years, you'd be missing out completely on the Facebooks, the Apples, uh, et cetera. Do valuations matter in these next year or so? Yeah, I, th I do think valuations matter. I think what's important to keep in, in mind, though, is you know at what price are you getting access to that future growth? And so I, I wouldn't say I'm you know valuation agnostic and just you know holding my hand up to, to buy the market blindly. Um, but I do think that there are some really compelling parts of the market where you can access growth, but at a, as, at a reasonable price. Um, so I think it's just really about being thoughtful in terms of how you do that, and then practicing alpha over beta, active management over passive. The FT had a really good piece uh, yesterday talking about the fact that equity 12-month earning yield, three-month bills, and most investment-grade bonds are all basically yielding the same thing. What place does cash have in a portfolio right now? Great question. Um, I think what we need to keep in mind is, you know, where in the world you're investing in, first of all. But I think certainly in the U.S., um, as we're seeing the Fed inching closer and closer towards, um, you know, finishing this hiking cycle, whether it's one more hike or two, it seems very obvious that reinvestment risk um, is becoming, you know, even more real now compared to where it was a few months ago. And so I think while some of those cash yields look really juicy right now, and certainly being in cash last year while central banks started to hike was really compelling, on a you know looking forward basis, I think you know certainly that's going to grow more challenging, and so we're looking really I think to extend duration, mm. um, specifically as economic growth starts to I think you know get more sour. Right. Okay, Madison, thank you so much for joining us. So cash isn't trash, but maybe you know push it to the side a little bit. Madison Fowler there of J.P. Morgan Private Bank. Now coming up, we're going to continue the conversation over the state of the U.S. and U.K. economy. We're going to be speaking to Harry Colvin, senior market strategist at Longview Economics. Next, this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London with Kriti Gupta in New York. 
Now, joining Critty and me now is Harry Colvin, Director and Senior Market Strategist at Longview Economics. Harry, thanks so much for joining. Um, it might be a little bit more calm this morning, but I'll tell you, the UK two-year uh, UK two-year yield yesterday was was really remarkable. We're back above five percent. We've got CPI. We've got a BOE decision this week. How worried are you about the UK? Well, we're pretty worried. We're in the midst of a generational interest rate shock, not just in the UK, but in the US and, of course, across Europe as well. And it's going to cause a lot of pain, particularly in the housing market. And if you think about the way we run our economy, sadly, we've got one of the worst economic growth models in the West, in the UK. We rely on rising house prices, asset prices generally, strong positive wealth effects, and then more appetite for consuming and, in particular, borrowing. It's a terrible way to run your economy, but that's how we do it. So. When money tightens up, we have problems, particularly in housing, with the consumer. So Bloomberg Economics has this piece out basically saying if we go to 6% from the BOE in terms of rates, we're going to get a recession. It's going to bring GDP in by about 2%. Does the BOE need to err on the side of caution? Again, just given that transmission mechanism we were talking about with mortgage rates. Absolutely. They've over-tightened policy. So has the Fed. So has the ECB. And they set the stage for a recession because all of these central banks have what we call Volcker religion. They'll do anything to fully purge inflation from the system. They're paranoid about repeating the, the Arthur Burns years of the 1970s where they didn't squeeze inflation properly. And so recession, in their mind, is a price worth paying to kill inflation mm. off. Well, Harry, walk us through then the story of how that translates to the rest of the world. You're seeing this kind of extremely hawkish action in the BOE. You're seeing it in uh, the Bank of Canada, the RBA, and certainly around the world to lean hawkish. To what extent is that going to kind of influence the Federal Reserve that is kind of the contrarian right now in talking about pausing? Well, they skipped, didn't they? But let's not forget it was a hawkish skip, and there were two more 25 basis points hikes. Um, in, the, in the dot plot. So they want to keep going. They want to keep money super tight. We've got an inverted yield curve. We've got very tight credit conditions. And importantly, we've got a turn in the credit cycle. And therefore, we're going to increasingly see a turn in the economic cycle. So I think the stage is set for recession in the US, probably beginning later this year, if not early next year. Well, isn't that recession then kind of priced into the market then? Talk to us about the translation into kind of the longer term thinking from the Federal Reserve as we're talking about not cutting rates for perhaps years, at least that's the phrasing from Chairman Powell. What would may have them change that view? Well, firstly, it's not priced into markets. We had the low in the equity market in the US in October. And if you look through the history of recessions, there have been 15 recessions since and including the 1929 to 31 depression. And in almost all of those, the equity market bottomed either during the recession or after it had finished. So if you want to believe we've priced it in, you have to believe that that was all done in October last year, potentially a year before the recession even started. And I'd say as well, it's not priced into the rates market, certainly not priced into the credit market. We've got high yield credit spreads trading at around 500 bips. Really, we want to see them at about 1,000 to feel like the credit market's priced recession. So that's, I think, a unique opportunity for asset allocators today, that we've got a recession coming, but it's not properly priced. Yeah, even triple Cs. I mean, the junkiest of junk bonds had a rally last week. What does the default cycle then look like in, in your mind? Well, it's potentially a large one because we've got a lot of zombie companies in the US. We think there are about 10% of the listed corporate sector that are zombies. These are companies that have been un unable to cover their interest expense with their EBIT for three consecutive years. And they're going to be struggling in higher rates. So that's the risk if you want to create a really bearish scenario. But probably it's going to be a relatively mild recession. And I say that because the US is structurally much stronger than it was, say, 10 years ago. Um I mean, look, I, I'm still kind of getting over, over the fact you're saying that everyone has over-tightened. Basically, all the central banks have over-tightened. So, so what, do, what do we do from here? I mean, is, is it too late then when it comes to central bank policy? Do they need to start cutting? I think it's too late and they can start cutting, but I doubt it's going to make a lot of difference, which is always the case as you go into recession. They start cutting, but the recession dynamics have already started to emerge and unfold. The dominoes have started to fall and the dynamic is at play. So, and then it takes a whole cutting cycle usually to properly stimulate the economy and cause it to reaccelerate. So I think all the tightening's in the pipeline. It's too late. And what we do is we move underweight equities and overweight bonds. Well, Harry, then talk to us then about kind of the issuance or the deluge of issuance that we're expected to get over the next weeks and months from the Treasury. There is a question in these credit markets about just how digestible that is. Is that something that you're worried about when it comes to these credit conditions? 
Absolutely. I mean, I think you've got to remember the reason, one of the key reasons we've had a very strong rally in risk assets, particularly in tech, is because we've had all this liquidity as the Treasury's been drawing down its balance, the TGA, this is its balance with the Fed. So, look, it's going to have to rebuild all of that, and it does it by issuance. We're going to get about $1.3 trillion of net new issuance by, the year, by year end, and that's going to suck liquidity from markets. So this is a really key reason to be, to be bearish on equities and other risk assets over coming months. But, Harry, isn't the market already dealing with a liquidity story? We've been talking about these kind of credit uh, liquidity for, I want to say, at least a year and a half before even the banking turmoil came about and before the Federal Reserve was way uh, farther into its rate tightening cycle as it is now. Why is this liquidity warning different than the others? Well, the liquidity warning I'm really talking about is, is, is the Treasury sucking liquidity out of financial markets. That's what I'm referring to, and that's a big problem. I think perhaps the liquidity you're talking about is the signs that we're seeing junk bonds failing. We're seeing some failures at the margin. We've had a little mini banking crisis a few months ago, and I think there'll be much more of that coming, uh, particularly given the outlook for the credit cycle and just how tight credit conditions are in, in the banking system. Harry, I feel like after this conversation, I need to go into my portfolio and make some changes. Yeah. <laughs> Harry, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Thank you so much for joining Harry Colvin there, Director and Senior Market Strategist at Longview Economics. Now, coming up, we're going to take a look at some of the market-moving events you need to be watching out for this week. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Kriti Gupta is in New York. Now let's get a quick look at what's ahead this week. We're going to be hearing from Fed Presidents Bullard and Williams later today. And then we're going to get the latest inflation print out of the UK on Wednesday. The data has been hot. Plus, it's a busy day on Capitol Hill, Chair Powell's congressional testimony and a Fed nomination hearing. And then a Bank of England rate decision coming on Thursday. Bloomberg Economics says if they go to 6% this year, we're going to get a recession. And then finally, rounding out the week, we're going to get PMI data from the U.S., U.K., and Europe on Friday. But, Critty, just this week with Bullard and Williams, I mean, those are two central bank speakers, two Fed speakers known to be a bit more on the hawkish side. Uh, if you're Harry Colvin, who we're just speaking to, he's probably going to be cringing watching them because he says the Fed has already done too much and they should be cutting. And we know, of course, James Bullard, to your point, yes, very hawkish, but also kind of known as almost front-running what the Federal Reserve can do. So market's very sensitive to what comes out of his mouth. But, Danny, I got to say, the BOE really in focus, I think, even stateside, more so than usual, simply because we've had this deluge of central bank decisions that have really surprised to the upside, the Federal Reserve notwithstanding. I wonder what kind of precedent the BOE sets here. Yeah, and, and look, when we talk about long and variable lags, presumably those are shorter in the UK just because of the state of mortgages here, the fact that they're usually around a two-year mortgage, not like 30-year of what you have going on in the US. Um, so if inflation isn't yet coming down, how long are the lags really? Do they need a hike more? And do they risk really doing some damage to this UK economy? I'm glad you brought up the housing piece of the equation, because of course, there's that structural difference between the US and the UK. But something that stood out to me in Chairman Powell's last uh, press conference was when he talked about the housing market. He actually said, look, some of these shelter costs, they're coming down, but he thinks they're bottoming out. He's actually preparing himself for perhaps another leg of prices getting higher, reversing perhaps some of the softening that we've seen in the housing market, which if you're worried about inflation being led by those shelter costs, that isn't exactly a good sign from the chairman of the Federal Reserve. So, Danny, that's something that's kind of on my on my watch list there. Oh, I got to buy a house in New York at some point. This this is not good news for me, Critty. Do you have anything <laughs> else to cheer me up this morning? <laughs> you, me, and, and everyone. I think we all want a little bit of New York City real estate. <laughs> I, wanted, I don't have anything to cheer you up, but I do have some pre-market movers that I want to uh, right. put on our <laughs> radar here. Uh, something, a story that's coming from uh, the other side of the Pacific, I should say, Alibaba specifically, uh, seeing a little bit of a shakeup in their leadership. Shares down about 2.4% when you look at their ADRs here. Naming a, a new chairman, uh, replacing their old one. Now, the, essentially the idea here is that although that is a shakeup that kind of favors one of Jack Ma's kind of close confidants, a lot of the street is saying, look, we got to see the growth first before we really kind of uh, install a good chunk of confidence in, in this new restructuring. Yeah, we're in the post-tech crackdown era in China, which, as you say, has been difficult for Alibaba.
It really has, and, and it's not just Alibaba alone. Then you go to around the world to other tech companies, really kind of butting heads uh, with the respective governments, which brings me to Adobe shares down about 1.3% in the pre-market. Also taking a hit this time, the FT reporting that the EU is preparing to launch an antitrust probe with the Adobe Figma deal. It's about a $20 billion deal set to take place later this year. And again, the European Union coming out uh, very aggressively with those uh, tech concerns. Yeah, yep. Of course, the one right before this was, was Google being hit with an EU charge over its tech dominance. Um, so, you know, the EU leading the way here when it comes to some of this regulation. They're leading the way in regulation, but Europe is also leading the way, I want to say, in kind of innovation and diversifying a little bit. Stellantis is a great example this morning. STLA is your ticker. Their share is actually down 2.8% as well. Sentiment is not great, we should say, on, on both sides of the Atlantic on the micro front. But essentially, they're partnering, partnering excuse me, with Foxconn, which we know as the major chip supplier to Apple to create kind of a semiconductors company. This would be uh, kind of based in Netherlands, but really trying to amp up their exposure to uh, the auto space and, and how they can kind of enter the future when it comes to the auto story, Danny. There's a lot going on with chip manufacturing right now. Intel yesterday announcing they're going to get some German subsidies and going to open up a plant there. So they're spending more. It's everyone trying to chip away. Uh, oops, I, I actually did not mean to make that pun, but chip away <laughs> at some of these supply chain issues. Yeah. Uh, 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 that was bad. Uh, and, and, no, it's okay. It's an appropriate pun, I think, uh, for 5.55 in the morning, New York time. Uh, I also just got to very quickly put on your radar, Danny. We do have FedEx reporting after the bell. So we've seen a lot of tech-heavy stories right now, down about two-tenths of 1%. But at the end of the day, we are going to be looking out for those earnings and seeing just how much margin improvement they have given their own restructuring. Yep, absolutely. A pandemic darling. Is everyone still ordering stuff online? I think the answer is uh, probably yes. <laughs> anyway, that's it for early edition. It was great to be with you today, Critty, and to join you on surveillance and still surveillance. More is ahead. They're going to be speaking to Brown Brothers Harriman and JP Morgan.